Today we, we welcome uh, uh, Professor Shayan Mitra from uh, University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. Um, Shayan's been there ever since he graduated from MIT uh, a number of years ago. Uh, his uh, work is in uh, formal methods and rigorous reasoning about uh, cyber-physical system design. Um, I would say that he is a leader and a pioneer in this area in many, in many senses. Um, and so, um, give Shayan welcome, and we will need to be done uh, well before uh, we need to be out of here by 1.50. So, um, uh, so, let's not waste any time, and well, welcome Shayan. Uh, thank you very much. Introduction. Uh, this is actually my first time in Connecticut, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, can everyone hear me? I know some people are watching remotely. Is the mic picking up? Is there a way of telling if it's all okay? Yep. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, analysis of cyber physical systems. So um, in my view, cyber-physical systems are the systems where you have computing elements interacting with physical processes. And these systems are now cropping up everywhere from self-driving cars to embedded physical devices, power systems. Um, and so with the disproportionate growth of computing in many of these traditional industries, now new features are driven by computing communication and sensor technology. And that's, a, of course, a wonderful thing. Uh, it allows for flexibility, uh, new kinds of uh, design decisions. It also brings some challenges. Uh, so we have had our first uh, unfortunate uh, fatal accident involving a semi-autonomous car this year. Um, this may not be such a surprising statistic to you, but uh, uh, when I talk to ordinary uh, computer scientists, they are surprised that 50% of the cost of building a modern aircraft is actually in uh, building and integrating the software. Then there are recalls, of course. There are uh, millions of recalls uh, of cars every year, costing billions of dollars. And the same is true for medical devices. And, uh, the, there is this interesting study from NIST, published in 2013, which shows that some quarter of all the medical device recalls are because of software design issues. So, very difficult problem to design software for these kinds of systems, and this has been succinctly uh, stated by Jeanette Wing as, how can we design cyber-physical systems that we can bet our lives on? Now, of course, there are many different approaches, and there's a large body of researchers working on cyber-physical systems, reliability of cyber-physical systems. The approach that uh, I've been looking at for the last 10 or so years is based on the principles of rigorous uh, systems engineering or formal methods, uh, where the idea is you start with uh, requirements, correctness conditions, uh, that specify what the system must uh, satisfy, and then you develop techniques, uh, design automation tools, to check that the designed artifact meets these requirements. So today I'm going to talk about two different kinds of requirements. Uh, in invariant properties are sort of the first thing that you look at when you're designing a system. Uh, for example, in an adaptive cruise control system, if you want to say that two cars never come within some unsafe distance between each other, that would be an invariant requirement because you want this property to hold all the time. Okay? So always is the operational term here. And um, last part of the talk, I'll focus on a new kind of property, which is about privacy. So increasingly, we are building these systems where users can share some data with the idea that with more data, we can improve the performance of the global performance of the system. And there are some very interesting questions in, in the trade-off between performance and privacy of these systems. Now, these two topics may seem disparate, but there is a central idea that animates the, uh, the solutions that I'm going to talk about today. And this idea is notion of sensitivity. So let me spend a moment defining 
uh, this notion of sensitivity, and then later on we'll be more precise about it. Uh, so any system model, you can think of it as a mapping from a parameter space to the space of behaviors of the system. Uh, and these behaviors, we'll call them trajectories or executions. So for example, for a differential equation, uh, you have a model of the system, which is x dot equals to fx. f is the right-hand side of the differential equation, the polynomials. For a state machine, you have a bunch of states and potentially some inputs. This could be a stochastic transition system or a Markov decision process. But in either case, uh, given a set of parameters of the system, let's say the initial state in the case of the differential equation, it defines a unique behavior of the system. And likewise, for the Markov decision process, if you specify a sequence of inputs that the system experiences and an initial state, that defines a particular execution of the Markov decision process. By the end of it, you probably get a probability distribution over states as opposed to a single state. Then, in either of these two contexts, uh, sensitivity is really capturing how much the behavior of the system changes as you change the parameters defining the model. So for example, for differential equations, if you change the initial state of the system, the behavior of the system will change, and sensitivity of the system will capture how much does it change, or give an upper bound on the change. Similarly, for the uh, <coughs> Markov decision process, if we change the initial data of the model and keep the inputs the same, that will give us a notion of a different behavior of the decision process. And we want to capture what is the change in the behavior. Okay, so we'll be more precise about the definitions later on. But at this point, it suffices to say that both in designing verification algorithms and in uh, developing uh, me mechanisms that preserve privacy, this notion of sensitivity in its different guises will become important. All right, so here is the plan for the talk. So I'll uh, um, spend a little bit of time talking about the simulation-driven verification approach that we have been developing for the last uh, five years now. And then um, I'll first talk about the basic idea of simulation-driven verification. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the tool that we are building. And then <clears throat> I'll spend a little bit more time talking about a compositional approach for doing uh, sensitivity analysis. And then the last part of this talk will be about this privacy problem. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so uh, let's uh, dive into invariance verification. So what's the problem here? So we are given a model <coughs> of the system, uh, potentially with uh, adversarial inputs. And we are given an unsafe state, u. And we want to answer the question, <coughs> Does there exist any trajectory of the system from any of these initial states that visits the unsafe state? Is there a possible behavior of the system that is unsafe? <clears throat> and uh, we would like to design these algorithm which uh, answers this question. Ideally, this uh, algorithm will have one of two kinds of outputs. Either it will produce a particular behavior of the system that violates the property or visits the unsafe set. So that output would be used as a bug trace. We can then use it to debug the system. Or it produces a counterexample. Counter excuse me, not a counterexample, but a proof that the overall system is safe. The proof will basically show somehow that all possible behaviors of the system, starting from all the initial states, do not enter the unsafe state. So uh, this proof certificate can itself be a useful thing, uh, not just for uh, sort of the satisfaction that I've developed something that is rigorously proven to be safe, but increasingly uh, both the auto automotive and the aerospace industry are moving towards these standards where you can gain certification points by using formal models. And potentially in the future, this proof certificate can be used as a part of the uh, demonstration that your artifact, the controller that you've designed, uh, meets, the, meets the standard. So 
BO-178C, for example, for aerospace systems, already makes provisions for using these types of things. Okay, so I started with a model. Let me tell you what kind of models uh, we want to analyze. Uh, so typical control system looks like this. There's a plant, and there's a software that is interacting with the plant through sensors and actuators. The software, of course, is some code. The plant is some complicated <coughs> model. Uh, if you're lucky, someone has bothered to write down a differential equation describing the model. But often, for real systems, uh, there is no such differential equation. It's some uh, massive uh, diagram that someone has created, maybe a collection of simulink files. And sometimes, you may not even have access to, um, to these uh, the internals of these models. So for the purposes of gaining understanding of this uh, problem, we will actually abstract away from many of these complications. And we will work with this very general uh, class of models called hybrid automata, which look like this, uh, this diagram over here. And later on, I'll comment on how we are taking some of these approaches we de develop in this idealized setting and apply it to uh, these scenarios where there are no models. Okay, so a hybrid automaton is basically a state machine with states and transitions, except now in each state has a set of differential equations there. So think of it as a differential equation driving the dynamics of the car or the plane, and then there is some software which changes the behavior of the car, right? So the software makes some decision, uh, sets some values, sets some actuators, and that changes how the car is going to be. So this software action is modeled by these guards and resets. Okay. The actual formal model is not going to be very important uh, for my talk today. Uh, it uh, just suffices to know that there is a large body of work addressing the verification problem for hybrid systems. Uh, let me give you a brief history of that. Uh, so in the early 90s, people were looking at solving this verification problem for hybrid systems and quickly hit a wall which says that even for very simple models, this problem of checking invariant properties is undecidable. Okay. Uh, so then, in the late 90s and early aughts, the research <coughs> focus shifted towards uh, an approximate version of this problem. So instead of trying to, this, trying to answer this question for unbounded time, people reconciled to solving the problem for bounded time and also answering the problem approximately. So now, uh, recall the verification question I posed earlier, uh, safe or unsafe. So now, uh, having hit the big wall up there, people were okay with having some false positives and false negatives. So sometimes this verification algorithm will give a counterexample, which is not really a bug, or say that it is safe when uh, the system may not be actually safe. The other thing that happened in the, in the late 90s is new data structures for representing these over approximations. So there were works on uh, ellipsoids and zonotopes. Uh, and uh, the other approach was to come up with new ways of constructing these abstractions. <coughs> so now uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about what has been happening in the last uh, five or 10 years, which is building up on these data structures and abstraction techniques to actually try and make these approaches scale to realistic models. Okay? Um, so we are going to focus on nonlinear models, which is common in uh, almost most applications. And we are going to rely on simulations, because in many cases, you cannot even solve the models analytically uh, when, you, when you're working with uh, realistic systems. Okay? So, let me start by uh, giving you an overview of what simulation-driven uh, verification means. Some of you have probably seen it. A um, lot of this work started in collaboration with Sridhar, who is here now. Um, so the basic idea of simulation-driven verification is uh, as follows. Uh, when you have a complicated system, let's say you have some space of uncertainty, this blue box, over which you want to prove that the system is correct. And here, correctness means 
that it does not enter this uh, red set, the unsafe set. Okay. So one thing you can do is you just run a bunch of simulations of the system. Okay. And this is what is done today. Okay. You run a bunch of simulations, and if you're lucky, eventually you may find a simulation that enters the unsafe set. Um, so, simulations and tests can help you find bugs, but even in this very simple case of a two-dimensional system, it's a purely nonlinear system, there is no hybrid jump, nothing. Even in this system, you cannot really prove that the system is safe, because there are uncountably many points from which you have to run simulations, and you cannot, cannot really do that. So the basic idea of uh, simulation driven <coughs> verification is to start from a single simulation like before. And now what we'll try to do is from that single simulation, we'll try to compute an over approximation of what can happen, not just starting from the initial point of the blue line, but in the neighborhood of that blue line. And how we compute that over approximation is the key to our technology. But for a moment, let's just pause here and see uh, what this enables us to do. So if, for example, we can compute this over approximation, uh, sometimes that may not be enough, you see, because here, this over approximation actually intersected with this red box here, which is uh, not conclusive. Okay, so we generalize that simulation to this gray box. But here, the gray box intersects, uh, the, the gray tube in, intersects with the red box. But that does not mean that the actual system violates the safety property, right? Because this is all an over approximation. So in that case, what we have to try to do is uh, come up with a finer over approximation of the system. So now, we are going to create a smaller partition of the space that we wanted to cover and successively compute tighter over approximations of the system, so that eventually, at least that's the hope, <coughs> we can find these over approximations that are disjoint from the red box, like it's happening here. So now this green over approximation helps us infer that from certain neighborhood of the initial state over here, all possible behaviors of the system do not enter the red set, and therefore we can eliminate that part of the test space. Okay. And if we can do that for all these little boxes, as it's going to turn out over here, then we can prove that the system is safe. But even if we cannot eliminate all possible uh, boxes, this helps us zoom in and find that one or two uh, simulations that are real <coughs> counterexamples of the system. Okay, so in this uh, animation, we are going to find uh, we are going to be able to prove safety of the whole thing. And then there is a, another animation here which shows <coughs> that we are able to quickly eliminate large chunks of the state space and uh, find a counterexample. Okay, so that's uh, proving safety. And here is another simulation of the same algorithm, which first was inc inconclusive, but then quickly after a lot of refinement, it is able to find that one execution, which is uh, entering the red set, and it did not have to run tests over the rest of the state space. So here we are using a simple binary space partition to eliminate large parts of the state space. That's sort of not the important part. The important part is to be able to start from a single simulation and generalize it quickly to cover a large part of the test space. Okay, so the main question here is, how do we do this generalization? How can we go from a single simulation to cover a large part of the parameter space over which we want to do the test? And then there's this other question, which I'm not going to talk about much today, uh, which is to handle the switches and the reset. So this picture and uh, rest of the talk today is going to be about uh, differential equations, systems which are more or less continuous. But then if you want to apply it to the kind of systems that we want to, uh, 
uh, where you have continuous dynamics together with software, then you have to deal with these switches. Okay, so there's also work on that, but I'm not going to focus on that today. Okay, so uh, the first step uh, we took in back in 2013, and this is uh, the paper I was mentioning earlier, joint work with Sridhar and my uh, collaborator Mahesh Vishwanathan, is we defined this idea of uh, uh, a discrepancy function which captures how much you need to generalize a simulation. So let me walk you through this definition here. This thing is not working. Okay, I'll point over here. So a discrepancy function takes a pair of roots <coughs> and a point in time and gives an upper bound on the distance between two tra trajectories that start from neighboring states. Okay. So this picture is helpful. So let's say you have two trajectories, one green and one blue, and they have some distance between them. So a valid discrepancy function in this case would be a function beta which gives an upper bound on the distance between the two trajectories. So the actual distance here is this purple line, uh, and a valid discrepancy function, for example, could be this uh, light blue line, which is an upper bound on that, right? So if, so if you have such a function, uh, it also has to satisfy this other property, that is, uh, as the two states get closer and closer, this uh, discrepancy should become zero. So if you pick two points which are closer together, the upper bound on the trajectory between them should vanish at any given point in time. Okay. So what's the assumption on the function? On beta? Oh no, on the original function. On the differential equation. It just has to be Lipschitz continuous, which is sort of a standard assumption uh, if you want uh, uniqueness and existence of solutions. So any continuous Lipschitz continuous function. Okay, so uh, if you can find such a discrepancy function, then in a moment I'll show you that uh, this algorithm that I sketched in the previous slide of simulation, bloat, eliminate, that algorithm actually gives you the properties that you want from a verification algorithm, okay? Um, so a lot of the energy goes into actually figuring out how to find these beta functions. And the first thing that was noticed in this original paper is that even if you use the Lipschitz constant, let's say f was the differential equation back there, and l here is the Lipschitz constant of that function, then you get this discrepancy function. The distance between the trajectories can be bounded by e to the lt times the original distance between the two states. This is just using Gronwald's inequality. Uh, you can get this bound, and therefore this function here is a valid discrepancy function. It meets the requirements we have up there. But it's a horrible discrepancy function. You almost never want to use it because it has this exponential dependence on time. So it's going to blow up and fill up the whole space. You won't be able to prove anything with it, essentially. So uh, let me summarize the results of uh, the correctness of the algorithm. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about how we find discrepancy today. And then I'll take a slightly deeper, deeper dive and tell you this compositional approach for finding discrepancy. So there are two properties for any algorithm, any verification algorithm that you want. One is soundness, which says that it gives the right answer. And the other one is completeness, that it actually gives an answer. It terminates and uh, uh, gives you an answer. So we have those two properties, well, almost. Uh, soundness says if, an al if our algorithm returns safe, then the system is safe indeed because we are constructing it over approximations. And if we can find a counterexample, then it is a true counterexample of the system. For completeness, we have what is called relative completeness. And roughly what it says is uh, if the system is robustly safe or unsafe, meaning not only is the system itself safe, but small perturbations to the system's parameters, like the constants you have in the differential equations of the guards, if you perturb them a little bit, then the <laughs> resulting perturbed system also continues to be safe. Okay. So that would be robust safety and safety, and similarly you can define robust unsafety. If there is a counterexample or a bug in the system and you change the parameters of the system, 
that change system will continue to have a bug. Okay. And this robustness assumption makes a lot of sense, right? particularly for these control systems where, first of all, you have uncertainty in the model parameters. Then you have this uncertainty when you implement a controller in some floating point unit. All these calculations are not really accurate, right? So what you want to verify is properties that are robustly safe or unsafe. So it's not a very uh, harsh requirement that we are imposing on the system. So if you have that, if the system is robustly safe or unsafe, then the algorithm will terminate. That is, it will either find a proof or it will find a counter result. So that's the uh, summary of what you get from the algorithm if you have a discrepancy function. <coughs> okay, so uh, I was telling you earlier that uh, you can get this horrible discrepancy function just by using the Lipschitz constant. Uh, then there were some results on very specific kinds of systems like linear systems. The first completely automatic approach we found for computing discrepancy functions was this ADVA paper, my student Chu Chu Fan, and this works for any nonlinear system. Uh, then we applied, uh, uh, developed a new technique for computing discrepancy functions in a compositional fashion where the idea is to analyze large system where many modules are interconnected in a network. So this is the work that I want to uh, go into a in a little bit more detail. Uh, so these two things happen concurrently. And then we applied this approach to this uh, uh, cardiac cell network problem. This is a, like a challenge problem in this verification community. And I'll, I'll show you what that example looks like. Uh, so those were the theoretical developments after that uh, first work. And subsequently, we have also had a sequence of tool papers uh, in developing this tool further and applying it to uh, case studies. So the case studies are starting to happen now. Uh, this one was about this uh, Howard King control system that uh, Toyota researchers proposed to us, and our tool was the first one to verify it. Okay. <clears throat> so let me uh, show you what this tool looks like just uh, just for fun, and then we'll switch back and uh, tell you about this compositional approach for verifying discrepancy function, finding discrepancy function. So here's the example uh, I, uh, I'm going to show you. So we are designing, let's say, an auto-passing system. There is a car that has to overtake uh, a leading car. And so the variables in the model are the relative speeds, relative accelerations, and things like that. So x is the distance between the cars along the highway, and y will be the distance across the highway. Omega is the heading of the car. So if you're designing a control system like this, probably the controller goes through several phases. So first, uh, the failing car comes a certain distance behind the leading car, switches to the left lane, tries to overtake, gain some distance ahead of the car, then switches back to the right lane. And there could be additional logic, like if the blue car now starts to race, then you want to probably switch back behind the, behind the car. So you can model such a system as a hybrid automaton, and that's what we did. And if you... Okay, so this font size is too small for you to see maybe, so, uh, and I cannot increase the font size here, so just bear with me. So if you load the model, this is what you will see. Uh, this is basically the hybrid automaton model. So there are variables, the x, y, z, etc., and the different differential equations are getting parsed as part of the model. And then there are these transitions down here which show that what are the rules for switching between the different modes? Okay, so this is the model, and the tool just loads, parses, and shows you what the model looks like. And then there are the requirements. So the requirements look like this. I uh, can't probably read this, but basically this is a mathematical formula saying uh, whenever the two cars are in the same lane, then the distance between the cars should be 
greater than some threshold. Okay? If the cars in the, are in different lanes, then the x distance between the cars could be small because then the cars are overtaking. So you would write down the requirement like this. And then ideally, and we have uh, different things you can do with the model. You can simulate the model, just draw many, many simulations. That's probably a fast operation and is good enough for finding some bugs. Or you can say, I want to verify the model. And I already did verify the model, so let's do this one more time. So when the model is loaded, it actually compiles the model uh, into C code so that it can then run uh, ODE solvers on that C code to uh, verify them, to generate the simulation. <coughs> okay, so now it's uh, verifying. I'm just verifying two of the seven requirements that I have from the control system. Uh, so the first one got verified in this case. It turned out to be safe. If it is safe, then you can also look at what got computed, the artifact, in this case, the reachable set of the system, and then do various plots to see what the reachable set looks like. So I'm just plotting the X and the Y, uh, the X separation and the Y separation of the two cars. And what you see here is uh, the x separation is uh, was negative initially, and then it became zero, and then it becomes positive because the car is successfully overtaking. And there is some thickness to it because there is uncertainty. So uh, you don't know exactly where the car is at a given point in time, but there's a bound on where it could be. And the y separation is the green curve, which shows that the trailing car first switched to the left lane sped up and then came back to the right lane. And the interesting thing here is, of course, that while the car was in the same lane, which is where the Y curve is closer to zero, that is when the separation was not close to zero. The X separation was not close to zero. That's why it turns out to be safe. Okay. So this computes the set of all possible behaviors of the two cars from a range of initial uh, positions and velocities, but you could do the same kind of analysis for other parameters that you care about, like the controller parameters that you are unsure of, different road friction values. Uh, you can change the behavior of the leading car to look at a range of possible things that the other cars are doing to see if your passing strategy is still safe with respect to uh, the opponent's car. So we have shown this to various uh, various car companies, and they, they seem to be interested in doing this type of analysis. So there's some traction here. Uh, let me now tell you about this idea of how do you do this discrepancy computation for very large networks. Okay? So this is the work from HSEC 2014 paper with my student, uh, Jen Chi Huang, who actually just defended his thesis on, on Friday. So. Um, once again, we are in the world of differential equations, but all of this carries over to hybrid system with little extra work. But now we'll view the system as a large network. So each node in this network has a differential equation, x dot equals fx u. So there is some input coming to each node. And the edges in the network suggest that uh, the two nodes interact with each other. So this is a very natural model for power systems or biological networks where each node is, let's say, a substation, and the edges indicate that there is some physical or electrical coupling between the different substations. That's the model. Uh, once again, we have the dynamic function for each node, and the communication could also be delayed. So uh, the input to the ith node, ui, is uh, the actual state, in this case, of node j with some delay. Okay, and the the setup is to have constant delays only so far. 
So the overall dynamics of A node can be written down like this. And once again, we want to compute a discrepancy function of the overall system. We want to get a bound on the distance between two trajectories. Uh, but here, we don't want to look at the dynamics of the whole system. That's just too complicated. Uh, we want to do a static analysis or formal analysis of the individual nodes. And somehow that analysis should help us construct the sensitivity or discrepancy of the overall system. Okay. So, um, first we define a new kind of uh, discrepancy. Uh, we look at the individual modules of the system. And now the module has inputs. So, once you fix a particular input signal for that module, that defines a particular trajectory of that module. So, if you give it a different input, you prime, that generates a different trajectory of the system. Okay. Now we'll change the definition of discrepancy which captures the sensitivity to both the initial state as well as the input. And this is inspired by this notion of input to state stability that came out of control theory. So now we have two functions, beta and gamma. And beta captures the upper bound on the effect of changes in the initial state and gamma captures the upper bound on the changes in the input to a particular model. And once again, we'll require that if the two initial states converge to each other, then beta goes to zero, and if the two inputs converge to each other, then the gamma function goes to zero. So if you have such beta and gamma functions for the individual modules, how can we put them together to construct a discrepancy or sensitivity function for the overall system. So that's the main problem. And here is the, here is the result we have. Uh, we show that it's possible to construct a reduced model. So let's say we have these two modules. Each of them are some, let's say this is five-dimensional, this is six-dimensional module, and they interact with each other. From this original system, we will construct a one-dimensional approximation for the first module and another one-dimensional approximation for the second module. And the way the approximations work is defined by differential equations, where the right-hand side of the differential equation is given by the beta and gamma functions, uh, which are part of the discrepancy of the module. So from this 11-dimensional system, now we have a two-dimensional system. And the result is that the trajectories of this reduced model, much smaller dimensional system, actually gives us the sensitivity of the original system. Here is, uh, here is what I mean by that. So from this reduced model, we can simulate the reduced model. Uh, and we show that the reduced model has the right kind of properties that it has uniquely defined trajectories. And then um, that trajectory of this reduced model is actually an upper bound on the distance between the trajectories of the original system. Furthermore, if you start this reduced model from uh, some delta, and as that delta goes to zero, the error bound on the trajectories also goes to zero. So here's what we can do then. So you start with the original system, <coughs> you construct the reduced model, and then now you'll simulate both the original system and the reduced model, okay, separately. And if you bloat the trajectories of the original system by the factor given by the reduced model, this is actually giving you an over approximation of the reachable set of the original system. So you never had to actually compute analytically the sensitivity of the original system. Because of the theorem in the previous slide, uh, just the trajectories of this reduced model is enough to construct the reachable sets of this, uh, uh, of this big network. OK, so uh, just to give you a sense of how this 
this can help us in analyzing large system. So you're looking at uh, this challenging benchmark problem. Uh, this is coming from a number of researchers who are looking at verifying uh, cardiac pacemakers embedded in, uh, in, in cardiac tissue. So actually Scott Spoka is one of the people involved in this work. Uh, so they have this complicated looking uh, uh, models of cardiac tissue. There are these different cells, nerve cells or cardiac cells, and the cells interact because the voltage is sort of uh, between the cells uh, excite neighboring cells and so forth. Um, and these are hybrid models not just purely dynamical systems. And uh, in MATLAB, the model looks like this. Each of these things are a different cardiac cell oscillator. And inside that, there are all these transitions. And we are able to verify models of up to eight or you know, six or eight uh, uh, cardiac tissue components, which uh, scales to something like uh, millions of uh, ODEs and transitions the first uh, uh, verification result of this, this model. Okay, um, so I think I'm uh, sort of short in time to discuss the privacy work in, in detail. So let me just give you a, a sense of what the problem is, okay? And how sensitivity is related to that. So many... privacy and performance. If you share information, then you can improve the performance of some uh, uh, control system, but you don't want to share too much. So what is the sweet spot where you share enough information to help the overall system, but then you also have privacy in some rigorously defined sense? So we have a sequence of papers on this topic. We started from simple consensus problems and then uh, developed this theory for more general control system. So I don't think I'll uh, go into the model in detail, but I'll just mention that um, the, no the notion of sensitivity still um, comes up here. Uh, so for that, I need to say something about what I mean by privacy. So we adapt this notion of differential privacy, which has uh, been very successful in uh, databases and also in the theoretical computer science community. In this context, we will say that uh, consider two data sets, okay? And let's say the data sets are just the sequence of waypoints that people are going to visit. Uh, so we will say that two data sets are adjacent if they are identical, except the data of one person is different. So for two such adjacent data sets, we will say any system is epsilon differentially private if the probability that some output S came from one data set is very close to the probability that the same output came from the different data set. So what differential privacy really says is, uh, by looking at the output, 
we cannot say with any high level of confidence whether the output came from the data set where a particular individual participated or not. Okay? We cannot infer it with uh, any high level of confidence. Okay, so we want differential privacy of these control systems, and what we show is that uh, the way to get differential privacy here uh, is by adding noise to the communication. So you share your information about where you are and where you want to be, but you add some noise to it. Now, this idea of adding noise for privacy is pretty standard, uh, but the way we add noise, how much add we noise, is a function of the sensitivity of the system. So we define sensitivity of this, uh, this turns out to be, we, we model it using a Markov uh, decision process, we define sensitivity of the Markov decision process, and once again, computing sensitivity is a complicated thing, but we can do it for linear systems, for nonlinear systems, we can approach it using the techniques I talked about in the first part. But once you have sensitivity, uh, then by adding noise to your communication, according to this Laplace distribution, which is a function of the sensitivity of the system, you can get privacy. Okay, so that's sort of the, uh, the uh, point I wanted to make about this part. Uh, and um, not only do you get privacy, uh, differential privacy in the sense that I defined, but because of this rigorous approach, you can also then compute what is the cost of privacy. So for example, you can define the cost of the overall system as how much, how, let's say your cost is just the L2 norm. Like if you're far away from your waypoint, you pay a price. And longer you stay away from your waypoint, higher the price, right? So that's the L2 norm, uh, expected value of this. And we can define the cost uh, the baseline cost as the cost of the system where everyone is sharing all the information, right? So that's the best you can do. And then cost of privacy we define as the cost you get by using this private mechanism. And then you take the difference of these two things that gives you a, a, a sense of how much you're losing in optimality of the system by using this private mechanism. Uh, and we, we show that and the cost sort of scales uh, inversely with the number of participants and proportionately with the time horizon. Uh, for this particular scheme that I uh, mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, so let me uh, wrap up. Uh, so I, I think this area in general of combining formal methods with data is an interesting one. Uh, they, it goes both ways, right? One is there are these systems where a lot of data is being used. Uh, how do we do formal analysis of these systems? And secondly, also for traditional systems, how can we take advantage of data? And formal methods, uh, one can approach it in two different ways. One is for doing an analysis and the other is for synthesis. And this uh, simulation-driven verification, I think, is an example where Simulation data together with formal analysis is giving us algorithms for doing uh, verification. And I would say even verification for realistic systems. Uh, so the next step here that I'm looking at are these approaches for learning the discrepancy from simulations where you don't have the model exactly. And so we have done some preliminary work here by looking at these complicated models, uh, black box approaches for learning discrepancy functions. And for synthesis, uh, the second work that I didn't spend much time on is an example of that where uh, sensitivity is helping us design algorithms which are uh, privacy preserving and do some trade-offs between privacy and performance. Uh, and uh, another interesting direction here is to look at uh, sen controller synthesis together with system identification. And there are a lot of new directions here uh, to apply these type of approaches to not just um, control problems, but also distributed optimization and uh, learning problems. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, the main collaborators of the work that I uh, presented today. Genchi is the one who led the work on compositional discrepancy analysis. Uh, and uh, Mahesh Vishwanathan has been a long-term uh, collaborator. 
and uh, this research is supported by NSF, NSA, and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. So I think I rushed a little bit, but let me stop. Maybe time for a quick question, and then we're off. Thank you. Uh, nice, nice talk, thank you. Uh, many, many problems are with switches. So what happened, he shared a few lines on the switches, because with the switches, uh, sensitive, they break down. Yeah, so the way we are handling switches so far, mm -hmm. uh, we are doing sensitivity analysis of the different models separately, and then we try to bound the set of states that you could reach at the time of the switches. Okay, so if you can over-approximate the set of states that you can reach at the time when the switch happens, so you start there and then you solve a new problem. Now, this over approximation at the time of switches itself can become very, very large. And that's where the, that, that's where the challenge is. How to contain that over approximation is, is, a, is a tricky thing. But if it's a purely switch system, I will say, where you know it's entirely just based on timing, every five seconds you switch to a new mode, that problem I think we can solve pretty scalably. If it is a system that is switched not based on timing, but based on some actual state okay. condition, then this is a trickier problem. Okay. Okay. Another question in the back? In one of your slides, uh, you were mentioning that, uh, for example, the communication between nodes has just some sort of delay, right? Yeah, it can have delay. So what if we have a noisy system, like, you know, we don't have just delays, we have random noise, you know, and the data that we have as the input we want to model the system is somehow randomized or, you know. Yeah, so, so do we have, like, my question is, do we have a probabilistic verifier that outputs, for example, the probability of 0 0.6? Yeah, yes. Yeah. No, so all the work I presented about verification today are about systems where uncertainty is modeled by non-determinism or bounds. Okay, so that's how we would model you know, uh, uncertainty. But there is, a, again, a large body of work on what is called statistical model checking, which is trying to uh, handle problems like what you described, right, where the model itself is stochastic. So, uh, nice talk, thank Thanks. you. But, um, for, uh, for the MPC uh, model predictive control community and, and robust uh, control of model predictive control systems, uh, which I did before too. So uh, the reachability was, so for example, we always start with a state bounded by a polytop. And more often it is it passes through a linear system, again with a polytopic approximation of the disturbance set. So then almost analytically I can compute the reach of this. And if the reach is invariant, uh, then for infinite time I can say that this will yeah, be there. Yeah. So, <laughs> but can you do that for nonlinear? For nonlinear, it's yeah. tricky. So this, yeah. I think if you're in the world of linear systems, I cited some papers of mm -hmm. what was going on in the 90s. There are nice tools for actually computing research. And what you're saying is maybe MPC gives yet another way of solving the reachability question. You're probably right. Uh, for nonlinear is where you know, things start to become difficult and these approaches might be handy. But your simulations, are, are they valid for infinite time? or No. No. no, so I, at, at a later point, the trajectory might come back into the... Yeah, so this is all about bounded verification. Mm -hmm. And we have some ideas about how to go from bounded verification to like, unbounded properties using ideas like inductive analysis. And, but okay. We have that. One more question, and then we have to rush, please. Yeah, uh, next call. Uh, and in, this, uh, in your report, you mentioned uh, a simulation-driven algorithm. And uh, I want to know, is there any application in the industry or smart building? Smart building, uh, I think there's a toy benchmark problem that people talk about where there are a bunch of rooms and each room is controlled by a thermostat and you can switch it on and off, so that makes it a hybrid system. And there are some things people have done to verify it. Uh, we haven't, uh, but the, the approach could be applicable. But beyond that, like a real smart building application, I haven't seen much. Maybe Trigger knows more. Right. Great. Well, let's thank the speaker for coming.